Hi, this is Joni Swedland. Welcome to the Strong Women, Stronger World podcast, where each episode we interview different leaders to help accelerate your leadership learning, challenge you to take risks, to advance your own career, and teach you how to lead from inside out. My comments and insights are based on my own experience, which span a 27-year career in global management consulting, including 18 as a partner. This podcast is meant to inspire and empower you to action. It is time to step into your power. The world needs more women leaders. Together, we are strong. Strong women, stronger world. Our topic today is get out of your head intuition as your secret weapon with our special guest, Shelly Rowe. Shelly is the founder and CEO of Blue Fjord Leaders. She is an Inc. Magazine Top 100 leadership speaker and certified speaking professional. A professional engineer and former senior government executive, Shelly engineers leaders to see beyond the data by creating skilled self-awareness empathy and communication for decision-making, delegation, teaming, and more. Welcome, Shelly. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thanks, Joni. I'm so pleased to be here. I love talking about strong women. It's great. Excellent. Excellent. Well, um, we are just so delighted that you're here. And why don't we start with you sharing a little bit about your background and your journey on what led you to focus on intuition? Well, you know, Joni, you mentioned I'm an engineer. So I have been in the engineering world my whole career in transportation engineering specifically. And it's um, I've, I've loved it. It's been a great career. It's filled with people who are very technically oriented, right? We're very logical, we're analytical, we're rational, we're problem solvers, we're all that. And that's really great until you move into management. And so when I moved into management for the first time, which was relatively early in my career, suddenly knowing the right answer and being able to calculate the answer wasn't helpful to me at all. Because now I'm dealing with people, I'm dealing with complex situations, things where there isn't data, there isn't necessarily a right answer. And I found I was kind of stumped. So I uh, actually kind of went on an interior journey and and did a lot of reading and a lot of studying. Um, I took a number of courses. um, And I think what I discovered is that I had to listen to the little gut inside. And I had to do it in a way that was uh, smart. It wasn't just a whim. Uh, And it was when I began to trust some of that, that I made better decisions. I became a better manager, became a better leader. Uh, And it's led me to talk to other leaders about their journey and find out that, you know, this is really a legitimate thing. And now with the neuroscience, I can actually give it a scientific foundation, which makes this engineer very happy. Wow, there's so much there. I think you you touched on such an important transition for a lot of leaders that going from just being an individual contributor and really great at what you do to this whole new world of managing people. And that is a major shift. And then in addition to that, you brought up this really interesting concept of trust, trusting things that may not necessarily just be right inside of you, but something you're feeling inside. And then I loved how you grounded that in science. All right. So let's start with how important is bringing intuition into your leadership? Um, Are you finding that this is a usual practice or is this an exception to the norm? Yeah, I I interviewed, um, when I first started my company, I interviewed 77 executives literally about this issue. How did they make decisions? How or did they use intuition, gut feel in their decision making? Since then, I've talked to another 18 leaders more generally about leadership skills that they see in the future. So I would say that um, in that first round of interviews, 76 of the 77 told me that intuition was absolutely essential to their leadership success, right? So it was a very overwhelming thing. Um, To my surprise, no one struggled at all to have this conversation with me. 
Um, many of those people I interviewed were technical people, engineers who had moved into leadership roles. Uh, not all were, but uh, many were. And what I heard from them was very similar to my own journey, that they had started out in a that's more kind of rational, logical approach, but they had learned through trial and error and making some bad decisions that there was value in learning how to understand and to analyze and to trust that little feeling inside, uh, but not blindly. They did it in a really uh, thoughtful sort of a way. Um, the other interesting thing I learned too, Joni, is that I interviewed some politicians. And so if you think of the work that politicians have to do, they're in a completely different world, right? They're dealing with issues that are highly complex. They probably don't have a right and wrong answer. Uh, they're having to meld um, thinking from a lot of different people and bring people on. It's just very people focused. When I asked them about overthinking, about thinking too hard about something, they literally didn't understand the question. They completely understood how to work with people and getting a sense of people, getting a feel for what people could support. They were all over that, but this rational, logical, that just wasn't, it's not something that they have available to them really in their world and the kind of decisions that they face. It's fascinating. That is fascinating. It's so interesting. And, you know, as you talked about, um, sometimes when we just uh, don't pay attention to that little gut feeling inside, I know personally from my own experience that that's typically when I find myself in a mess um, because <laughs> I didn't listen to that little voice that was trying to maybe guide me a particular, you know, to look at other choices or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I love this idea of the politicians and you're right. It, it's so interesting that they have to be so people focused because, you know, it's the voters that are really putting them in their position. So they, um, but it's interesting that they're not in their heads because a lot of us as leaders are in our heads a lot. <laughs> so um, how, you know, and just speaking of it, I guess the, you talked a lot about informed decision-making and right now the big trend in business has been big data and, you know, data analytics and data-driven decision-making. So how does intuition fit into these complex decisions that we need to make as leaders? Yeah, and there is so much being written about data-driven decision making. And as again, as an engineer and a technical person, I'm all about the data. And I would say too that even though I'm, I talked about the politicians, they were getting the data they could get. It's just they live in a world where there really isn't a lot of data around some of these issues that they're facing. Um, so I am a big fan of using all the data you have in the time frame that you have to to make the decision. So if you've got some information, if you've got some science, if you've got data, then let's get it on the table, right? Let's get it on the table. It's just, that's not the only thing, particularly when you get into environments of high levels of complexity, ambiguity, where there isn't a clear right and wrong answer, then you want the data that you can get and you wanna be able to examine, and that is the word, examine that little gut feel, right? So I'm, I talk about and teach the integration of the two. That's really the key. I'm not a fan of just data-driven decision-making or just going on that gut feel. Right? That can lead us down an inappropriate path too. So you have to examine the data that's coming from your gut just like you would examine the data that's coming from your head. So it's the examination of the two together that that's where we can get our best decision-making. I love that idea of blending the, you know, the data and the hard facts with the intuitive and, um, but you're bringing kind of a pragmatic approach, but you're still, it, it, it appears that you're, you're helping um, others to really broaden the choices that might be available to them as leaders. Yeah. And examine, you know, what they're feeling about it. And that's where the neuroscience has been really helpful, Joni. Um, 
is what, what the, that little sense that we get is actually coming from a part of the brain that doesn't have access to language. Um, it's where our value systems, our habits, our filters, the kind of the stuff that makes us us and makes us comfortable, that's what the brain wants to see. So if we experience something that is a little different from that, or maybe in conflict with that, maybe there's a person that we have to work with whose value system just isn't in sync with our own. The brain observes that difference and interprets it as a threat. Now, it's not really a saber-toothed tiger, but from the brain's perspective, it can look a like, like a saber-toothed tiger. So it creates that threat response in the brain that creates that little discomfort feeling, but language isn't in that part of the brain. So all we can do is say things like, it just doesn't feel right. I'm not, I don't feel comfortable with that decision. And that's, that's something that's a miss for us, but left unexamined, it could lead us to do things that we're just comfortable with. We're comfortable with that person because they're like us. Right now we get a whole room full of people that are just like us because it feels good. Or we end up doing only the thing that we've done before because it just feels comfortable. Right? So if we have something that is different for us, the brain can perceive that as a threat and creates fear. Well, I don't know how that's going to play out. I'm afraid it won't work. I'm afraid I'm going to fail. I'm afraid it's, it's not going to be okay. And now we're making a fear-based decision without even realizing it. So that's why we have to examine it. And then we can go, so, oh, you know, I really, there's no reason to be afraid of that. Now I know better. So I don't need to let that fear control the decision. And I can make a decision for a different reason. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And I love that this whole idea is stretching leaders to also get out of their comfort zone. Um, because we all know that when we get into that stretch zone, that's where we really grow as leaders. And what you're talking about is really is doing just that. It's, it's basically stretching yourself um, and your thinking and being able to really not come from a place of fear, but come from a place of abundance, come from a place that you have an abundance of choices. And now you are more empowered to be able to make an informed decision. Yeah. And I think that's a good point, Joni. I, one of the things I talk about in my, my training programs is if, if you don't examine that little feeling that you get, then you're a slave to it. Right. It's actually in control of your decision making. And it can be just sheer comfort or it can be fear. And you need to decide. Right? You need to choose consciously what is the best decision once you consider, am I just don't I just don't want to get out of my comfort zone? Or I'm just too afraid of a situation to move forward in a different way. And it's that informed, skillful, insightful approach that I think makes all the difference. And that's where we get astute, wise leaders that have really good judgment. Absolutely. So tell me, Shelly, are there any particular decisions that would benefit more from tapping into your intuition? Yeah. And, you know, we've talked a little bit around the edges of it, Joni, uh, and you can kind of look at it by the ones that, that don't need intuition. Uh, and those are, it's a pretty short list, actually. <laughs> um, things that you can calculate. But, you know, I, again, I'm an engineer and we would calculate beam sizes. We would, you know, calculate uh, water flow and pipe sizes. So that kind of thing, while it seems very complex to do the math, it's actually a pretty simple decision. You do the math, you get an answer and you're kind of there. Um, so that's one that, that really is pretty straightforward, doesn't need a lot of intuition. The other one is if you are for, uh, facing a decision that is very much like a decision you've made in the past, right? So you've got some history with that situation, the decision. That can be one too that you can just make pretty quickly. However, and it's a big however, you have to ask yourself, is the situation today and into the future a lot like what I faced in the past? If it is, then you're probably good to go. But many of our industries today, we're facing so much change, not only with the pandemic, but with technology. So the 
future doesn't look a lot like the past. So you can't even rely necessarily just on your history there too. So the intuitive part comes in and is really essential in anything that's highly complex, um, where there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of ambiguity, again, things that involve a lot of people. We are not logical people. We, we don't necessarily make strictly logical decision. We think we do, but we really don't. I miss because of the way the brain is structured. So anything that's got a lot of people, ambiguity, uh, no clear right and wrong, that's where you're going to want to absolutely examine that little feel inside. That makes total sense. And I love that we are complicated as human beings. We are beautiful and messy and emotional and have all those things wrapped into the logical as well, right? Yes. Um, so what holds leaders back from tapping into their intuition? Mm. I ask myself that every day. <laughs> and yet the research and the interviews I did kind of tells me the answer. Uh, I would say it's summed up in two words. One is trust and the other is credibility. Um, and I don't know that it's true for everyone, but in a lot of the people I interviewed, again, a lot of them coming from technical kind of backgrounds, they were like me. As a young engineer, I was taught and told there are no place for feelings at work. And that's what we were taught, right? It needs to just be rational and logical, no place for feelings at work. And so we were taught to just kind of tamp down any of the feelings. We certainly never talked about it, right? And that's the other part that gets to credibility. So that trust factor has kind of been beaten out of us uh, to trust our gut at all, or certainly not to examine it. Um, and before I go into credibility, just one little analogy around the trust thing. Um, when I talk about this, um, I use a car. So if you think about your car, if something goes wrong under the hood of your car, it communicates that to you through that little check engine light, right? Yes. <laughs> right? And so that check engine light actually doesn't give you much information, but you know that you got to get under the hood to examine it, to figure out what's wrong. And you don't want to go very far with your check engine light on because something's clearly wrong under the hood. That little nagging feeling that we get, that's our check engine light. And so that when we feel that little nagging feeling, that check engine light has come on. And just like the car, we have to get under our own hood to find out what's really going on that's creating that feeling. And then we're able to trust it so that, and because it really is legitimate and it's giving us legitimate information as we know how to understand it. So trust is a big one. Trust is a big one. And then credibility, you know, these leaders, 77 of them, and they're telling me how much they, they depend on that, that feel for a situation and that examination of what's holding them back and what makes them uncomfortable, what's not sitting right. And they examine it but they don't talk about it. Mm. They're afraid that there is a credibility issue that if you walk in and say, Hey, yeah, I made this decision. You know, it just is the one that feels right. That that's not a very credible way to lead. Many of them would tell me that they would assess everything and they would make the decision that feels right and then go get the data to support it. We need that. We feel that we need that data to be credible as leaders. And we do. There's some legitimacy to that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but the credibility of, of intuition in our decision making process is not very well recognized. Well, first of all, I love the analogy of the check engine light. And I, for all the listeners, when that check engine light comes on, check in with your intuition because you do not want to go far without checking in. Um, that's for sure. We all need to get under the hood. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, this trust and, and credibility. I do believe things 
are shifting a bit in corporate America um, based on the clients I work with. Um, and again, it can be different for different groups of people and different cultures. Um, however, I think with the whole wellness movement and um, more individuals starting to meditate and do yoga and do things that are going to open themselves up to actually slow down and have time to feel to feel <laughs> number one and, and two, to just get in touch with their intuition. It's opening up to that receiving for those intuitive hits. Um, but what I'm seeing is that more and more people are interested in learning more about how to go deeper in their intuition. Um, and if you look at some of the, the top leaders in the corporate world, I mean, think of like Steve Jobs. I mean, he always talked about, you know, always trust your gut and, you know, innovation is really dependent a lot on your intuition. Um, so I do think that um, there is I think you bring up some excellent points around trust and credibility. I do like the trending that I'm seeing because I do think that this is a secret weapon that you can bring in as a leader um, and really expand your choices and options that might be available to you. And I, it's so great to hear that, Joni, with your perspective coming from that that corporate background and, and all the experience that you've had working in, in corporate America. Um, and so it's very heartening to see that. And, you know, we're, I think we are seeing a shift in the, in, in kind of collective consciousness, so to speak. Yes. Uh, we're seeing mindfulness so much being adopted yes. uh, in corporate environments, which is great. It's great for our health. It enhances our thinking. Um, in fact, in the, in the intuition side of it, when we're looking at decision-making, one of the things I like to tell people is, you know, go get all the data. Go listen to your gut, understand kind of what it's telling you, and then get quiet. Yes. You got to get quiet. The brain will keep working. In fact, I bet we've all had that situation where some of the best ideas come right when you're falling asleep. Yes. Right when you're waking up, or you're out for your walk, or you're, you know, some quiet time is when the brain literally, and they can see it in the fMRI studies. You can see the different parts of the brain begin to connect in ways that we hadn't connected before, but it takes that quiet, that mindfulness, that, that, that letting the, the stuff settle out of the brain a bit so it can be creative and make some interesting new connections for us and get the, into the wisdom that we have inside. Shelly, this resonates at such a soul level with me. I can't tell you how many times I've been out like walking on the trail next to my house. And that's where these ideas and inspirations come. And I know um, I actually had read something around uh, Thomas Edison had a practice and it was uh, both focused and diffused thought. And as he was working on solving a particular challenge or problem or trying to come up with a solution, he would then take time, like you just talked about, where he would go and sit and take a little nap, but hold ball bearings in his hands. And then when as soon as he'd fall asleep, they would fall all over the floor and it would wake him up. But that's when he would get the power of the diffused thinking of just what you were talking yeah. about and bring that back to help him in solving those complex uh, issues. And, you know, there's a lot of, of really uh, super intellectual people who've done the same sorts of things. Um Edison is one, Hemingway, Einstein, quite a lot of them. And it's, it's not a big secret. And so I, I can use it very intentionally. If I'm stuck on a problem, uh, a lot of times as hard as it is to do, because I, I want to check things off my list, right? Yes. But as hard <laughs> as it is to do, sometimes the best thing I can do, I've learned, is to you know fill my head up with as much information as I can hold and walk away. Just walk away. Um, go do something else, something mindless. It needs to be something mindless. Yes. Take a nap, just like Edison, sleep on it and start again the next day. And the brain will reset. And I nearly always come up with a new idea like, oh, that's the key. That's the part I was missing yesterday. And it arrives overnight. 
And how easy and beautiful is that just to walk away? Yet sometimes it's hard for us as leaders to walk away because we just like you said, we've got our to do list, we want to get it checked off. And that's, uh, we're really kind of holding ourselves back in that way by not allowing that time to just reflect and and let our brain relax. And and you know, Joni, the other thing I talk to leaders about, um, because you know, from your experience, um, leaders in particular, people are at their door, maybe not at the door, literally right now, but they're after them all the time. I need a decision today. I need for you to sign this today. Yes. I need to see you get to approve this today. And so leaders have to have that internal wisdom. And this is where the gut can really play a good role when they get that thing and they go, Oh, they need the wisdom to say, not today yes. on this one. I need to sleep on it. And being able to say, "Mm -mm, I can't make a fast decision on this one. This one, my guts, guts in an uproar. I need to sit on this one. And the power and being able to do that, first of all, that demonstrates as a leader, your strategic thinking, Mm -hmm. because you're letting others know that you're taking this seriously and that you're really thinking this through. So you're actually not just buying yourself time, but you are demonstrating your leadership and asking for what you need. That's beautiful. That's great, mm-hmm. Beautiful tip. All right, so I'm really curious because you've interviewed these 77 leaders and the additional 18 leaders. And um, I'm really curious if anything came up around gender differences when it came to <laughs> intuition. Yeah. So everybody asks me that, you know, when they find out, I've talked to all these different people about their intuition and decision-making and leadership. And that's one of the first questions. Well, you know, was it different between the men and the women? And I would say no. Right. So that was an interesting finding right off the bat. In fact, what I found is that, uh, like I said, by far and away, they were all using that little gut feel in an informed way in their decision-making. Um, the men were very happy to talk to me about it. They had no qualms at all in talking to me and using the word intuition. Uh, the women, however, were probably maybe a little more open to, and and quicker to accept that little intuitive feel maybe than the men, but they all kind of learned it by trial and error. The women, however, were much more hesitant to use the word intuition. Uh, They did not want to be associated with women's intuition because they believed it created a credibility problem for them in their leadership. And goodness knows they didn't need a credibility problem, right? It's hard enough to get into a leadership position as it is. So they would not talk about women's intuition. They hesitated to use that word. They were more inclined to talk about gut feel. Uh, And gut's a little more of a kind of a masculine sort of a term. (laughs) So they were more inclined to talk about gut feel, but all of them were pretty unanimous in, you know, this is a really important part of my skill set. Well, that's fantastic to hear that everybody is seeing intuition as a key leadership skill and something that is really helping them in furthering their own decision making and um, probably other things as well um, within their leadership, um, uh, things that they naturally that they need to do. Um, So how can our listeners um, really tap into their intuition. I know we've talked about a few things. Do you have any like tips or hacks or things that you might be able to share with our listeners who may this may not be something that they've really attempted to do? Well, I, I, I think it's some of the things we've talked about a bit. One, I think the very first one is the acknowledgement that this is something that's real as a skill. It's something that you can learn and it's legitimate. Right. So having uh, accepting the credibility that the science now brings to us, that it's just a different part of your brain bringing data to you in a different way. So being able to, first of all, accept that this is real and giving its credence and developing the skill. So that's the first thing. Um, the second one is, be, is the quiet bit. You know, it's, it's being willing to get quiet. 
to, to be willing to let the brain do its magic. And it kind of is magic, really. It is kind of magic. But the, being able to just get, get quiet with it. Um, the other thing that I really would like for all of us collectively to do is to talk about it more. So um, when I interviewed those executives, one of the last questions that I asked them was, look, you've told me how important this intuitive sense is for your leadership and your decision-making. You've told me you had to learn it. What would have enabled you to have learned it quicker, to embrace it sooner, right? <laughs> <laughs> and what they told me is if, if we had talked about it in the decision-making process more. Mm. I said, well, okay, that's pretty brilliant you know, to bring it into the decision-making discussion along with the data. You know, this doesn't feel right. Why doesn't it feel right? Why is this making me uncomfortable? Why am I, why am I leaning toward this decision and that person? Why am I wanting to hire that person, but not this person? Doing a little more examination of what that gut feel is doing and doing it out loud. So it's part of the overt decision-making process. So I said, well, that's great. Do you do that? And they said, oh, no, no. <laughs> right, and it's back to the credibility problem. So it's a yes. little bit of that chicken and egg thing. Uh, but that is my wish for us is that we begin to understand this enough as a skill that is learnable and usable and embrace the wisdom that it can bring and talk about it so that others begin to understand it, not as something that's woo-woo, but something that's really a science-based part of our decision-making process. I love this. Really what you're talking about here is we need to model this as leaders. And I love the idea of starting a conversation just a, and making this a part of your normal conversation with your teams, with your colleagues, with others, um, because intuition is real. And also, just getting back to allowing yourself to get quiet. Um, I think about this in terms of uh, our brains. There's a side of our brain that is responsible for all of that internal chatter that's going on inside of our head all day long, right? And that's the to-do list and what really keeps us driving and, and keeping busy and taking action. But then there's that quiet and reflective side. And the only way we can tap into that, which that's where creativity, the intuition is, the only way to tap into that is to be able to give that other side of the brain a break. And I love this idea of just figuring out ways to get quiet. And you know, um, Joni, I, I love what you were saying about this. And by the way, you're starting the conversation. So thank you for that. Um, but in my book, and you can see it back here, just reach and grab it. One of the things that I talk about in my book, because I had to learn this, right, is I talk about thinking me and feeling me. Yes. And I imagine both of them on my shoulder. And so thinking me is the loud voice, right? Mm -hmm. I, I like to say the loudest voice in the room is the one inside your head. Um, yeah, and so thinking yes. me is like loud and kind of obnoxious and it's always talking. But this feeling me equally valid is that little soft voice inside. And we have to learn to hear it, settle things down in our world enough to be able to hear this. So we've got both of them in our heads. So I, that, that's the way I do it is I literally imagine one voice each on each shoulder. I love that. Right now. I love that so much. That is such a great visual. And tell us about your book. I want to know more about your book. Yeah. So think less, live more lessons from a recovering overthinker. <laughs> I think a lot of us could use that. That's <laughs> awesome, Shelly. Oh my gosh. I'm nail, nail, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is so awesome. All right. Well, I have to uh, definitely ask you because I, I love your logo here, the Blue Fjord Leaders. How did you come up with the name for your company? Oh, I'm so glad you asked me that. So, um, and this company is actually new. I've been, I've been doing this work now for, oh, quite some time. I guess I started in 2012 is when I started my company but I'm rebranding it right now. Uh, I mean, the first of 2021, we're rebranding to Blue Fjord Leaders. And the, the reason is, is it's just because of what we've been talking about, right? So in some traditions, land and mountains represents the power of intellect. 
while water represents the equal power of feeling and emotion. And so it's in a fjord that you have this really powerful intertwining of those two forces. And you see some of the photographs from around the world of different fjords, and they're the, they're the integration of both of them. That's the leadership work that I do is teaching managers and leaders, particularly those coming in from technical worlds like me, uh, how to integrate both of them in a skillful way, just as they come together in a fjord. So beautiful and so needed in this world, Shelly. That is so exciting. I'm really excited for you and your new branding. Um, that is just, I think it's going to be, just have big impact. That is wonderful. So tell the listeners how they can find you. Yes. Yes. Uh, please find me. I'm at www.bluefjordleaders.com. Uh, you can contact me at Shelly at bluefjordleaders.com. Uh, my book is available. Actually, I have several books. My husband, my late husband and I took a year off and lived in France for a year. So I have three books about that experience. And so that's the other one you see back there. But this is the one that's my tips that I had to learn in order to start recovering from overthinking and trust that little feeling voice inside my head just as much as the other one. So that's available on Amazon. Uh, it's also available through me, but Amazon's probably the easiest way to get that. Excellent. And then Shelly, before I let you go, I ask all of our guests uh, a special keystone question. What makes you feel strong? Mm, that's a great question. I feel strong when I know I've done what we've talked about. I feel strong when I believe that I have not only brought the power of my intellect, but also that wisdom from inside me and brought the two together. Um, I spent years pretending like I didn't feel anything. It doesn't work. And so now I feel strong when I know that I have really engaged that part of myself, trusted it, listened to it. And it has taken me on an absolutely amazing life journey from traveling all over the world, living in France, having a great career as an engineer and executive, and now being honored to do this kind of work to grow new leaders and new managers. Shelly, what an exciting journey. And it sounds to me like you are still just at the beginning. You've got an amazing journey ahead of you. So you are doing amazing work. And it was such a pleasure having you on the show today. It's been a pleasure, Joni. And you are doing amazing work as well my privilege to be here with you today and support your work. Thank you so much. And I just want to thank the listeners as well. Um, we look forward um, to hearing you on other episodes. And uh, we hope that you have learned a lot about tapping into your intuition um, and how to use that in your leadership today. Thank you for listening. If you are interested in supporting this content, please hit the subscribe button. This will help to bring much needed funding to bring quality programming to our listeners like you. Your support is greatly appreciated. We encourage you to leave comments. If you have suggestions for leadership topics, please provide those in the comments and we will strive to address those in upcoming episodes. It is time to step into your power. The world needs your leadership. Together we are strong, strong women, stronger world.